Who was Jessie Pope, and what call did she want the young men of Britain to answer? We'll discuss that today on Footnote in History. Hello, and welcome to Footnoting History. I'm your host, Elizabeth, and today we are discussing the life and works of British poet Jesse Pope. Every year in my modern world history classes, I finish our unit on World War I by reading the poems of Wilfred Owen, Rupert Brooks, and John McRae. At the end of each poem, I tell the students the poet's death date, and there's always this long, heavy pause of sadness, especially for Owen. As one student asked, why does it hurt so much more because his death was right before the armistice. This year, as the unit culminated, and I yet again turned to these poems, I thought about how Wilfred Owen seemed to be speaking directly to one person, or a small group of people in particular, those trying to get young men to sign up and fight and die for their country. I'm chagrined by the fact that it never occurred to me before to look up if he had a specific audience in mind. In my head, it was a vague specter of propagandists for the British Empire. But Owen was, in fact, responding to at least one person when he wrote in his poem, Dolce et Decorum Est, of his nightmares from watching a man die from poison gas, and concluded by saying, quote, My friend, you would not tell with such high zest children ardent for some desperate glory the old lie, Dolce et Decorum Est pro patria more, end quote. Who, then, was Owen speaking to? when he so bitterly thought about how the British government was telling young men it was sweet and good to die for one's country? Was it a schoolmaster? A minister? A member of parliament? No. It was Jessie Pope, a poet most famous for her war poem, The Call, published in 1915. Owen actually dedicated the poem to her originally, but in subsequent drafts he referred to her as a, quote, certain poetess, and eventually left off the dedication completely most likely to make sure the source of his ire was more general for those who supported the war. So who was Jessie Pope? Why did her poems become famous? And why is her name today not as well known as Owen or Brooks when during the war she was more famous than either man? Pope was born in Leicester, England in 1868 to Richard and Elizabeth who, all told, had three daughters and two sons. Pope was the fourth child but the third girl. She and her family eventually moved to London, but by that time, her, one of her older sisters and a brother had already gotten married and established their own homes. While the family was still comfortable in London and seemed to always live in nice, respectable areas, in Leicester they had had a live-in servant, but there's no record of servants at any of their London establishments. Pope was educated at the North London Collegiate School for Girls, which was founded in 1850 and seems to have been intended for middle-class girls with ability but modest family incomes. The school goals were progressive for the time period, and by the 1890s, a number of graduates went on to pursue higher education. The headmistress during Pope's time there was a Miss Mary Frances Buss, and she and the school were held up as models for how to approach female education. While there, Pope won prizes in needlework, scripture, and English before leaving school at 18. She also passed the Senior Cambridge Certificate, which was standardized tests of sorts, created by Cambridge University in 1858, and opened to female students in 1867, and during these tests, students at secondary schools throughout Britain would sit several exams in various liberal arts subjects to demonstrate their knowledge. The junior certificate was for those under 16, and the senior certificate, the one Pope took, was for the under 18. Pope, however, did not attend university. While we can't say for sure why she seemingly determined at age 18 that the academic path was not for her, and that instead she wanted to carve out a career without spending time at university, a piece she did in her 40s might hold some keys to understanding. In 1915, Pope published Verse Making Without Tears, which, as academic and Wilfred Owen scholar Jane Potter states, should be seen as Pope's, quote, public manifesto. Pope makes it clear from the beginning that she does not consider herself a, quote, genius, and she is very much a writer to make money. And for some of us, this will have a lot of shades of Joe March from Little Women and even Anne Shirley Blythe from the later books in the Anne of Green Gables series, and we can see a lot in how Pope presents her own work. In this piece, Pope also suggests that one choose subject matter that will sell. Perhaps we should see in Pope's work not only her own views, but her ability to read and understand the average British person and their beliefs and desires. Pope very much understood the market, 
at least until the 1920s, when the post-war generation of writers pushed back not just on Pope's work, but on the idealism of so many regarding the British Empire before the war. I'd like to return to Pope's life post-secondary school, though, and see how she rose to such fame, but unfortunately the records for this period of Pope's life in her 20s are scarce, and my attempts to supplement by turning to my favorite Ancestry.com and examining the census records for this period did little to tell me about what she did before her writing took off. The records have her living with her parents, sister and brother, in northern London in 1891, and ten years later living in a different but still prosperous area in London, although now only with her parents and brother, as her older sister had flown the family nest and gotten married in 1896. By 1911 and at age 43, it was just Jessie and her mother sharing a home. Her father had died in 1903 and her younger brother had moved in with their eldest brother. Pope's occupation on the 1911 census is listed as a writer authoress. So at least by that point, we know that she had arrived. So how exactly did she arrive? Well, in her early 30s, she began writing for Punch, a British weekly magazine of humor and satire and one that fans of Bertie Wooster, for example, will know well. The magazine, which by 1910 had a circulation of 100,000, was popular with many, but was especially dear to the British middle class who enjoyed the inoffensive nature of its humor. Pope's work fit in well there, and her sense of humor was well appreciated and well lauded in her day, and it was often noted in reviews of her work that one expected women to have no sense of humor, but that Miss Pope was quite the exception to that belief. As it was written in the evening news, quote, humorists are rare, poetic humorists are even rarer, and poetic humorists of the fairest sex, rarest of all. This makes the remarkable talent of Miss Jessie Pope all the more remarkable." End quote. In addition to making socially acceptable jokes, Pope was also known for her children's books with names such as The Jolly Anglers and Tom, Dick, and Harry, Their Deeds and Misdeeds. By 1910, Pope was also an editor working for the publisher Grant Richards. It was during this time that her ability to edit works, often in accordance with what seems to have been her political beliefs, begins to stand out. For example, she was given the job of editing Robert Tressel's The Ragged Trousered Philanthropist, which, in all fairness, was not quite the page-turner at 250,000 words, since it was the account of his 12 months working as a house painter in Hastings in England and attempting to avoid the workhouse for him and his daughter. And I mean, yes, 250,000 words, that's pretty long. It's almost, but not quite, George R. R. Martin territory. Pope cut it down to 100,000 words, and most of what she left on the cutting floor, she told others was, quote, superfluous. But it seems that her intent was also to limit any offensive aspects of the work, especially when it came to politics, religion, or sex. She, in essence, boldlerized it. Boldlerized being invented as a term when a Thomas Boldler edited Shakespeare's works in the early 19th century to make them more family-friendly. You know, out, darn spot. Okay, not exactly like out darn spot, but a little like out darn spot. And that's what Pope did to Tressel's work, which also left it far from making sense. In addition to promoting or protecting middle class sensibilities, Pope also promoted jingoism, meaning her work presented Britain in the light of a rather extreme form of nationalism as the superiority of the British was front and center, and supporters were in favor of using war and military endeavors to demonstrate their superiority and, you know, grow their empire. Jingoism became very popular in the late 1800s to represent the excitement of going to war as many conflicts were short or fought against indigenous people without the same level of technology. A jingoist attitude, for example, can be seen when John Hay, Secretary of State of the United States, described the Spanish-American War of 1898 as a, quote, splendid little war. Like many Britons, Jessie Pope seemingly bought into this belief system, and her work presented the Great War as yet another moment when the British would be able to demonstrate in a swift and glorious manner why the sun never set on their empire. As we know, however, the war was not going to be over by Christmas as many expected. Many of the boys sent off to war never returned, and those that did often suffered from a new and unseen injury, shell shock. Before all of that, though, Pope began to write pro-war poems early on in the engagement, and many were published in the British newspaper, The Daily Mail. The Daily Mail started circulation in 1896, and within a short time, the paper was seen as aligned with imperialist motives. Before World War I even started, the Daily Mail was seen as a warmonger, and it continually threatened that Germany was one step from trying to take over Britain. Jesse Pope's poems, therefore, fit perfectly, especially as in the early years of the war, being a soldier was voluntary. Conscription, or a draft, was not started until 1916. Even though the war only started in 1914, 
By 1915, Pope had enough poems to release two collections that year, Jesse Pope's War Poems and the aptly named More War Poems. By 1916, Pope published another collection of war poetry titled Simple Rhymes for Stirring Times. Jesse Pope's most famous poem, The Call, was published in 1915. In it, she exhorts the young men of England to don their khaki uniforms and to travel to France to defend the empire and not be a young man who stays home and bites his thumb instead of engaging in battle. But don't just believe me. Here are Pope's words from that most famous poem. Who's for the trench? Are you, my laddie? Who'll follow the French? Will you, my laddie? Who's fretting to begin? Who's going out to win? And who wants to save his skin? Do you, my laddie? Who's for the khaki suit? Are you, my laddie? Who longs to charge and shoot? Do you, my laddie? Who's keen on getting fit? Who means to show his grit? And who'd rather wait a bit? Would you, my laddie? Who'll earn the empire's thanks? Will you, my laddie? Who will swell the victor's ranks? Will you, my laddie? When that procession comes, banners and rolling drums, who will stand and bite his thumbs? Will you, my laddie? Pope, however, did not just speak to the young men she exhorted to serve. In her poem, War Girls, for example, she explained how the war allowed young women to also experience more freedom. The advent of conscription, however, seems to have led to a dip in Pope's popularity if we base it on her volumes of poetry. Of course, there could be another reason. The war was not yet over, the boys were not yet home, and poems written by the men who were fighting were also beginning to be published, not all of them painted as a rosy picture as Pope. By 1916, however, Jane Potter, who wrote two of the Pope works on our further reading at footnotinghistory.com, Potter explains that the tone of Pope's poems and short stories had begun to change. Women were exhorted at this point not to ask men about the war nor to glorify it when speaking to former soldiers. The message seems to be that soldiers who have returned do not want to discuss what they have seen. It is possible that Pope's own younger brother Frank signed up in 1914. A man with his name and about his age joined the territorial force, and, if it was her brother, saw a great deal of fighting and even earned medals. Another Frank Pope during this time died on the Western Front, and seeing her brother's names in the published death list might have also tempered her jingoistic feelings or desire to write and sell poems that supported the attitude. And again, the war wasn't over by Christmas, not by a long shot. It seems that Pope's brother Frank died in 1922. If he fought in the war, perhaps his death was related due to illness or some other injury. For many, by the end of the war, the glory had gone out of the fight, as Lucy and I relate in our episode, The Great Unpleasantness, World War I and Whodunnance. Additionally, the legacy of Pope's work can be seen in other pro-war pieces from this time period, such as Ella Montgomery's role of Ingleside, in which the Blythe family describes the decision of young men to join the armed forces as answering, quote, the call. For those of you who have listened to my episode on the Canadian home front during World War I through the lens of Ella Montgomery's Rilla of Ingleside, three times in that work is the phrase, the call, mentioned. All about how the boys, Jem, and then Walter have answered the call by signing up, and it is a nobler call than any other. Montgomery then believed in Pope's words. Fictional Walter's poem about a Pied Piper calling the young men of the Glen to follow him into battle is another way that the importance of Pope's works were felt outside of Britain or at least for Montgomery, when she wrote that book. In her thesis for her masters, Céline Langier states that Pope and other female poets of World War I are not known for one simple reason. When Paul Fussell collected war poems for his anthology, The Great War and Modern Memory, published by Oxford University Press in 1975, he only included pieces that represented the experience of people who had seen the battle, the men, the male soldiers. And this anthology continues to be the one most people turn to when studying poetry of the Great War. In recent years, attempts at correctives have been made, but still, Fussell's collection is the one most rely on, silencing Pope, but also many others who wrote from the home front. An odd omission in a war that was known and is taught as an example of total war, where a country committed everything to the war effort, and yet the legacy of the poems focuses mostly on those in the trenches. After the war, Jessie continued to write, although she mostly published children's work. In 1929, at the age of 61, she married Edward Babington Lenton, a recent widower. Now, as I was reading Jane Potter's work on Pope and reached the bit about Pope marrying Edward Lenton, I mumbled, you have got to be kidding. Why, you asked, did I have such a reaction? Well, because Edward was not just any widower. Remember how I'd been doing my bit looking up census and marriage and death records via Ancestry.com? 
Because of that, I knew that in 1896, an Edward Babington Lenton had married Elsie Pope, Jesse Pope's sister. Edward and Elsie had one child, Violet, and then Elsie died age 61 in April 1928. And then, in May 1929, Jesse Pope married Edward, and they moved to Great Yarmouth, where they lived out the rest of their days. Had Jesse Pope been pining for Edward for all of those years? Had Edward felt he married the wrong sister? Or did they take comfort in each other after the deaths of other family members, including Elsie? We don't know. In the 1939 England and Wales Register, Edward is listed as a retired bank manager, and Jesse Lenton, nay Pope, as an unpaid domestic servant, which at first glance made me wonder, was being a wife not as enjoyable to Pope as when she was single? Or was Jesse Pope demonstrating that wit that won her so much acclaim a few decades earlier? Actually, it's neither. Since the 1939 registry was for war coupons and other necessities, those without paying jobs but household responsibilities were listed as having unpaid domestic duties. Even if one, say, was only one or even eight years of age, as in the case of some of the Lenten's neighbors, or an unpaid domestic servant in the case of Jessie herself. The Lentons did have a servant, so perhaps Jessie enjoyed this return to the more genteel aspect of her childhood before her family moved to London. Beyond that, Pope passed away age 73 in December 1941, a week after Pearl Harbor, which in an odd way seems fitting. Edward died a few months later in April 1942. Now, you may feel that I've buried the lead with a bit about Jessie Pope marrying her sister's husband. But, as I'm sure Pope would be the first to argue, her legacy is so much more than that, and it is one that is still hotly contested. Her war poetry is seen as problematic because of its jingoistic nature, and it's also left out of anthologies because she was a woman writing about the war from the perspective of the home front. As Wilfred Owen's nemesis, she became a caricature and easy to dismiss. But Jessie Pope deserves to have her work returned to the record and examined not as a reflection or cause of Owen's anger, but as a woman who understood the market for literature and made a living giving the people what they wanted, even if it later upset many. War poetry is but one aspect of Pope's work. This has been Footnoting History. If you like the podcast, be sure to visit our website, footnotinghistory.com, where you can find links to further reading suggestions related to this week's episode, as well as a calendar of upcoming podcasts. You can also like us on Facebook and follow us on Twitter at History Footnote. Until next time, remember, the best stories are always in the footnotes.